Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is James White here um, at the Stevenson Center in Calgary. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this session. Uh, it's one of the Can SCMR monthly sponsored sessions uh, for advanced cardiac imaging, mostly in the field of cardiac MRI, but we have a wonderful guest speaker today who's Dr. Jonathan Leipzig who um, is vice chair of uh, radiology at UBC, but uh, is becoming increasingly known as uh, a truly outstanding clinician scientist with a Canada Research Chair in Advanced Cardiac Imaging, and is currently the president of cardiovascular, the Society of Cardiovascular CT. Um, he's really a, a world-renowned and leading scientist in advancing the field, uh, not only in the area of, uh, of cardiac CT, um, but really uh, across the spectrum of advanced cardiac imaging and is really an outstanding radiologist and clinician scientist. So um, it's a pleasure to have him speaking to us today. And he's going to be talking to us about cardiac CT for stable chest pain. And um, I think that you'll hear some words that really will make you ponder whether or not we're on the verge of a paradigm shift in non-invasive imaging for the assessment of patients with chest discomfort. And I think it'll provoke some really interesting discussion at the end. So, uh, Jonathan, um, please take it away. It's a pleasure to have you here. You're uh, a you. great colleague and friend, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Well, th thank you so much, James, for the, uh, both the opportunity and such a kind uh, introduction. I don't know if it's entirely deserved, but uh, I, I, I certainly do appreciate it. And I hope over the next 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes, uh, I can... Uh, through my slides, convince you at least that we, we need to be having a discussion about how, how we test, or for that matter, if we test low-risk patients. But if we do, uh, what is the appropriate paradigm given the evolution of technology, particularly with tremendous advancements in cardiac MR, you know, at places such as your site and, and uh, Montreal and elsewhere in, in Toronto across the country, as well as the evolution of cardiac CT. So. Without further ado, you can see my slides, unless I hear otherwise, I'll assume you can, so uh, I'll uh, get going. So I do have disclosures related to this talk. The, the only one that's really salient is that I have received uh, unrestricted grant support and have historically uh, provided uh, consultative uh, uh, services uh, to uh, HeartFlow, the makers of an FFRCT technology. So, you know, this is a, a clinical case that was lent to me that I've used before. Uh, and, uh, you know, after reuse clinical cases, because as a radiologist, I, I don't see many patients clinically. Uh, so this is a patient that was referred to, uh, to uh, my friend's cardiac CT lab, but a very similar uh, cases are referred to our lab all the time, as I'm sure to yours. 64-year-old uh, white male who had chest pain when he was arguing with his wife. It intermittently awakened him from sleep, and it may have occurred once while riding his bicycle uphill, but it dissipated with continuation of biking. So, you know, at, at very best, a typical chest pain. Uh, that being said, he's, he's Caucasian, he's 64, he's a male, uh, he's hypertensive and dyslipidemic, he's on medical therapy for both. Uh, when my friend, the cardiologist, saw this patient, he was mildly hypertensive and mildly tachycardic and uh, mildly obese. So a test was then ordered. And as has been taught to me by Jim Min and others and my cardiology colleagues through my training in advanced cardiac imaging and, and through my practice, uh, you know, traditionally these patients are worked up in a very stepwise fashion as guided by historical training and by traditional AHA ACC practice guidelines, uh, which involve three sequential steps that you all know very well, starting with uh, a history and a physical, the history, of course, to try and determine based on Diamond Forrester criteria the likelihood of obstructive coronary disease based on angina typicality, although we know that's limited in a modern population given the fact that uh, Diamond Forrester were validated in the, uh, in, the, in the late 70s. Nonetheless, those questions are asked as well as others related to the nature uh, of chest pain. The physical is taken and it's a lot easier to, to bring levity and, and make light when you're in a room with people than over the phone, but as I always like to tease, you know, the, when it comes to chest pain, uh, you know, obviously you're, not, you're trying to auscultate for an LAD stenosis, but that's only uh, modestly accurate uh, and has limited diagnostic certainty. Nonetheless, it's an important first step and I certainly, uh, you know, a, a good clinic, clinical assessment. On the basis of that clinical assessment and the Diamond Forrester calculator or various other elements, of course, then the patient is typically referred for uh, traditional non-invasive ischemia testing. 
as you all know, uh, with the exception of a couple of sites on the phone, uh, that's largely limited in Canada to uh, treadmill testing, uh, ECG treadmill testing, and uh, nuclear myocardial perfusion spec testing with you know modest pervasion of uh, stress CMR, uh, not anywhere near as much as it should be, obviously, given the relative uh, lack of accessibility of MRI. And then uh, PET, which is, uh, as I like to say, a rumor in Canada, with the exception of Ottawa and some you know, modest provision elsewhere. So on the basis of these non-invasive tests, a post-test likelihood is determined based on the presence or absence of ischemia and the overall burden. And then the clinical cardiologist, as you well know, uh, then determines whether he or she feels that they should just continue treating this patient, not really knowing their coronary anatomy with an assumption that they are unlikely to have high-grade obstructive disease, but with an assumption that they're likely to have atherosclerosis given the fact that he's 64 and a male with risk factors, uh, or in the setting of a positive ischemia test, uh, perhaps refer that patient on for an invasive evaluation uh, for possible revascularization. So you see that my, my colleague uh, sent this patient for a nuclear perfusion study, and they did a stress only given their concerns with regards to radiation, and the study was entirely negative. As a result, my friend uh, re reassured the patient, said, you know, you're likely to have some coronary disease. We're treating you medically, though. We'll treat you to targets. You know, chest pain's very atypical. It's unlikely we're going to improve your quality of life because your symptoms are so unusual. Uh, and prognostically, you should have a very good prognosis. The problem is, as I always like to say, why I didn't go into clinical medicine, is that patients are at times annoying and oftentimes right. You know, they come, the patient comes back to my to my friend and says about seven weeks later, says, Doc, you know, I had this chest pain again. And, and you know, maybe you weren't clear on what I was asking, but I wasn't asking, did I have a normal MIBI? I wasn't asking what my coronary flow reserve was, obviously. I wasn't asking if that had reduced my cardiac blood flow, but rather I was asking, do I or do I not have coronary artery disease? What are you treating when you give me hydrochlorothiazide? What are you treating when you're giving me uh, uh, my statin therapy? And do I need to actually, do I have prognostically significant CAD such that I may in fact derive benefit from revascularization? And I like to, and I show these, this next slide really because I think it highlights our clinical scenario. And that has been a historical disconnect between traditional non invasive ischemia testing and, uh, and uh, epicardial coronary artery disease. And it's not that nuclear myocardial perfusion testing is invaluable, and it's not that exercise status is invaluable, but neither of which are meant to localize or pinpoint anatomical coronary disease, but rather are markers of either advanced disease or of abnormal coronary flow reserve, which is largely driven not by the epicardial coronary arteries, but by the micro microvasculature, uh, given the fact that the epicardial coronary arteries are actually low resistance, high capacitance vessels. So in this exact same clinical scenario of uh, atypical chest pain, 60 year old, <coughs> excuse me, male, <coughs> pardon me, with a normal perfusion study, we've seen a whole gamut of epicardial coronary findings, be it severe anatomical stenosis, to no atherosclerosis, to very mild disease, to severe stenosis in the setting of very adverse plaque features. All of which are, uh, uh, you know, would be treated very differently, I would argue. And so some people, when I would show this slide, would suggest, well, you know, that's, that's anecdotal, Jonathan. That's really not the real world, and you shouldn't make something of just your few clinical cases. Well, of course, then I, I'd like to show this data to refute that, that if we look at data coming from the preeminent nuclear sites, such as Cedar sinai uh, Dan Berman's data from uh, Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, as well as other data, that we know that ischemia testing by nuclear stress testing typically fails to diagnose CAD in a large number of patients. In fact, a perfusion defect in, in, the, uh, in the 47 study meta-analysis published in Heart by Mahajan and colleagues had a sensitivity of 65% with an odds ratio of 0.79. But I think even more sobering, if you say, look, I'm not even... Uh, and I'll come to that in a moment, I, I suppose, sorry, I'm out of order. But, and if we look at Manesh Patel's data then, published in 2010 in the New England Journal, coming from the NCDR database, and then further iterated in the American Heart Journal in 2014, uh, 400,000 patients in the cath lab in the United States, the majority of the patients that go to the cath lab do not have obstructive disease at the time of their invasive evaluation. And importantly, about 40% of them have no disease at all by, by angiography measures. This is not inconsequential, of course, 62% of patients not having obstructive coronary disease. 
And many people look at Manesh's data and the NCDR registry and say, well, that's not our practice. They're not taking good histories. They're not doing appropriate testing. But I think it's time that we as in the field of cardiovascular medicine, you know, come off our high horse and leave our ivory towers and start realizing that someone is putting this data in there. And if you look at your own sites as well, the prevalence of non-obstructive disease is maybe not as bad as this, but it's nonetheless not 15, 20%. It's probably closer to 40%. How about so-called significant or prognostic coronary artery disease? You know, I've had people after I showed that last data suggest to me, you know, Jonathan, CT just drives unnecessary invasive evaluation. I'm really not looking for single vessel anatomical disease. I want to treat according to courage and treat patients medically, and I don't really need to see their coronary artery anatomy to do so. Well, I would argue that you probably do, because if you rely on a negative stress test or only a modestly positive stress test, you can see that the, major the sensitivity for the detection of left main disease or triple vessel disease in 2,300 patients is only 75% and only 40% specific. And if we look at one of the bastions of nuclear cardiology, a good friend, and I say this because he would show this slide too, coming from Dan Berman, if you say you're really concerned about left main disease or triple vessel disease, half of stress tests are only mildly abnormal or normal in the setting of severe left main disease. With 100 left main lesions in, at Cedar sinai 56% of them 56% of them had a moderate to severe defect, but 13 were entirely normal, and the remainder were only mildly abnormal. These are patients, if they were similar in their presentation to the patient I presented, that would likely not undergo an invasive evaluation with a normal ischemia test or a mildly abnormal ischemia test, and yet would be harboring a severe anatomical left main lesion. <coughs> um, and then if we close just on the last point that if we look at data that comes from uh, uh, my colleague here at UBC, John Mancini, who served as the core lab, for the uh, COURAGE trial as well as the O trial, you can see this very elegant analysis that was performed by him and then published in Jack Interventions from the COURAGE trial. He looked at which trumped which with regards to clinical outcomes. And you can see here, again, this is not stress CMR or PET, obviously, but nonetheless, ischemia testing. If you look at the ischemia burden, someone with more atherosclerosis but very modest ischemia burden had a much higher uh, rate of events, be it death, MI, or a non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome than someone with severe ischemia and very modest atherosclerosis. Similarly, someone with severe atherosclerosis and, and a significantly positive ischemia test has the most, prog uh, most adverse prognosis, really highlighting the importance, I think, <coughs> of the fact that uh, uh, atherosclerosis is a very important driver of downstream clinical events. So why should we consider CT? Well, I think from 2002 to 2008, really a lot of effort was placed to look at the diagnostic performance of coronary CTA. It shouldn't surprise us that coronary CTA as a strictly anatomical test, it's not a perfect test, but as an anatomical test, if the first clinical question being asked by the patient or the referring cardiologist is not what is what is the myocardial blood flow or what is coronary flow reserve, but does this patient or does this patient not have obstructive coronary disease, coronary CT performs very favorably compared to other tests. Here I highlight four multi-center trials which highlight both the strengths and the weaknesses of coronary CT. We can see that coronary CT has consistently a high negative predictive value and an overall high, uh, very high negative predictive value and a high sensitivity and more modest uh, uh, specificity and positive predictive value. Nonetheless, a very good rule out test and a reasonable rule in test with regards to uh, uh, the uh, severe anatomical stenosis by invasive coronary angiography. Now, people look at this as an Achilles heel of uh, coronary CT, I, the fact that its specificity isn't as high as its sensitivity, and, and I think it is a limitation. But I think with the evolution of, uh, of uh, both CT perfusion and FFRCT, which we'll talk about, we can hopefully even further enrich the population that undergoes invasive assessment following CT by uh, performing these other downstream uh, analyses, which I'll get to. And, you know, when I, when I show this, people look then will put out before me historical spec data that shows that it, in fact, performs very well as compared to invasive coronary angiography. And I would argue that that is largely historical. 
This is data that was published by our Armin Zadeh uh, in CERC Imaging late last year, I believe it was November, and this is data from the CORE 320 trial, which I'm sure you're mo all familiar with, which was published in the European Heart Journal in 2012. And I think there was a significant delay, and I know this is being taped, and I don't know it for sure, but there was a significant delay in publishing this data because I think it was fairly sobering. This was a CT perfusion trial in which patients underwent CTA and stress CT perfusion and underwent SPECT and invasive coronary angiography. And this sub-analysis looks at the diagnostic performance of CTA as compared to SPECT for the detection of and the exclusion from anatomical coronary disease by invasive coronary angiography. And you can see the AUC is not as high as in the accuracy trial for CTE, which was 0.94 or 0.95, but nonetheless 0.91. And here you can see the, the area under the curve for SPECT, which is a much more modest 0.69, with a sensitivity of 61%. So, you know, does SPECT have a role? Perhaps, but I, I really can't see in the modern day how it has a primary role in the first question of the detection of coronary disease, the adjudication of the need for revascularization or prognostication in someone with known disease, you can argue, but not as a first-line test, I don't think, for the detection of coronary disease. <clears throat> and here we could see then without prior CAD, CTA.92, and uh, without prior CD, CT, uh, prior known CAD, SPECT 0.67. Now I know it was it was discussed before, uh, uh, you know, and I think one of the real strengths and why we do a lot of cardiac MR nowhere to the level, uh, both volume nor academically, as as many of you on the on the phone. Uh, but nonetheless, we obviously uh, it's a tremendous tool for evaluation of a number of cardiac conditions and benefits from the fact that it, there's no ionizing radiation. That being said, as shown here, through the integration of a number of dose reduction strategies, be it limiting your Z-axis coverage, adjusting your tube potential and tube, uh, tube uh, current, using prospective triggering or high-pitch helical acquisitions, using a minimum tube acquisition time, using iterative reconstruction, you know, we've driven the doses down, maybe not routinely to 0.5, certainly that's not the case at our site, but our median effective dose is sub-2 millisieverts now at around 1.7, 1.8 millisieverts. Does that mean we should be serially CTing people without indication? Obviously not. But should this be a concern in a 64-year-old male with obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, uh, and uh, atypical chest pain? I personally don't think so. So coronary CT is a validated viable alternative to ischemia testing clinically. So people will say, you know, that's all ivory tower stuff. Where's the real world data? And as you probably know, there were two large randomized trials that were published in the last year. In fact, three, Avinci, um, uh, Scott Hart, and Promise that were published in, in very reputable journals that looked at the diagnostic uh, uh, performance of uh, uh, cardiac uh, CT. So if we look at the PROMISE trial being the first one, a randomization of thousands of patients uh, between two strategies, a traditional uh, stress testing strategy, and then we see the Scott Hart trial, which was performed in Scotland, Scotland both looking at uh, the utilization of CT as an alternative. And while some would say that, <clears throat> and we'll go through the data, CT itself did not save lives in the PROMISE trial. But you'll see that if you do a deeper dive, that there was a signal to reduction in MI in both of these trials, uh, and there was a greater efficiency in the diagnosis of CAD, higher CABG rates, uh, lower rate of non-obstructive disease at the time of cath. So we look at PROMISE to start with, published by, the new, by uh, Pam Douglas in the New England Journal. They randomized not three patients, but sorry, 10,003 patients, randomized again to anatomical CT and physiological testing. The hypothesis was that the use of CT-based strategy would result in a reduction in the incidence of death, MI, and hospitalization. And for those of you who do non-invasive testing, you know full well, that's a very tall order. To actually save lives and reduce events at one year or two years in a non-invasive in a non-invasive low to intermediate risk population is, is a tall order. Nonetheless, those were the endpoints. If you look at the outcomes of PROMISE, and, and we stratify them here, whether they favor CT or favor stress testing, you could see that the outcome at two years was there was equipoise, no question. It was not a positive study. CT did not reduce death and MI at two years. It did, however, favor CT at one year. It favored stress testing when you included treadmill testing, but it favored CT when you looked at SPECT alone. It favored CT with regards to cath normalcy. 
I think the triage to surgical revascularization, while not a hard endpoint, I would argue that if someone underwent cabbage and you identified two times more people that needed cabbage with CT, that it was unlikely to be sham cabbages, that these patients likely had significant coronary disease. We saw significantly greater adherence to statins, which we hope would drive better clinical outcomes, although we lack any randomized data to support that statement, I, I totally admit. And then there was equipoise uh, in quality of life and cost. When we look at Scott Hart, which you know I think got less uh, uh, play in the in the lay press because it looked it was done in Scotland first of all and not NIH funded, but a very important trial. They looked at both the hard outcomes, but also the, the diagnostic certainty, which I think, you know, I don't see patients, but I always talk to my clinical cardiologists, and when they're making decision, decisions around whether or not they should cast someone or treat someone medically or not treat someone, there's a lot of uncertainty with a normal myocardial perfusion study in light of Dan Berman's data. Do they have a severe left main lesion? Very unlikely on a population basis, but on an individual basis, distinctly possible. So diagnostic certainty, I don't think, could be entirely dismissed. But when we look at the heart endpoints, you can see that the, the heart endpoint of coronary heart disease-related death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke, if we look at standard of care versus CCTA, borderline p-values, not significant, but a, but a reduction in the hazard for both of these endpoints in those who underwent CT. Again, negative, but uh, certainly a trend, I think, you'll, if you'll give me that liberty amongst friends. So the final question, of course, that's asked, and people will say, well, you're showing there's some clinical utility here, Jonathan, but in the real world, CT drives unnecessary uh, uh, angiography and potentially revascularization. And I think there's certainly good data to suggest that that statement is true. I think that we hope, we hope that that's re re uh, decreased over time as the interpreting physicians get more comfortable and certainly reduce overcalling of stenosis, as the image quality gets better, and as the, uh, the people in receipt of the reports are less uh, reflexive in their referral of a patient with a mid-LAD lesion to the cath lab. Nonetheless, we need to do better. And of course, you know, this is a very important clinical question. Should this patient with a mid-LAD stenosis be revascularized? And I always show this slide, and you guys know this data as well or better than I do, but the totality of randomized data to date does not suggest that revascularization needs to be guided by angio by or is, sorry, that there's a significant benefit from uh, revascularization when guided by anatomy alone, at least as an upfront strategy. I mean, we all know there are limitations to courage and, and, and limitations to bury 2D, but I think we would all agree that in the absence of uh, severe osteal LAD disease, that there's, there's relative equipoise between revascularization and optimal medical therapy as an upfront treatment strategy, allowing for crossovers, obviously, downstream. And we do know that up until now, the only tool that has been shown to improve clinical outcomes when guiding revascularization in a randomized fashion is uh, ma uh, fractional flow reserve, which you're all familiar with. We know that that's the case both through the FAME-1 data, which showed that there was a 30% reduction in events in those who were revascularized by a fractional flow reserve as, as determined by an FFR below 0 0.80, as compared to those who were revascularized by angiography alone. We know that was also done in a cost-effective fashion. The problem is, as an anatomical imager, whether we do invasive angiography or coronary CT angiography or even MR angiography alone, uh, that there's an unreliable relationship between lesion-specific ischemia and anatomical stenosis. <clears throat> this is from the famous trial in non-ST segment elevation MI published from the uh, uh, the, uh, from a group out of Melbourne, a multi-center trial, and it really highlights a very depressing finding if you're an anatomical imager, and that is there's a significant number of patients with high-grade anatomical stenosis that are FFR negative. Here we could see above the 0.8 threshold. Similarly, there's not an inconsequential number of patients with, F, with uh, anatomical stenosis below 70, maybe women with atypical pain that are getting sent home from cath labs all the time, being told that they have modest anatomical disease, but they may very well have positive FFRs. And this is not new data, of course. This is very similar data now shown for CTA by Bob Meijbohm from, uh, from the Thorax Center, published now in 2008, where an anatomical stenosis by CT is as likely to be FFR negative as it is to be FFR positive. <clears throat> 
So where can we go? I mean, there's a lot of options following the diagnosis of anatomical disease. We can do things such as hybrid testing, as has been pioneered by people, our colleagues in Ottawa, and, and, uh, and uh, Johanny Knuti and others in, in, uh, in uh, Finland, looking at utilizing downstream PET testing. Certainly, stress CMR has been shown to be effective by a number of groups on this phone, and, and groups from Holland as downstream uh, uh, adjudication of likelihood of FFR positivity. But another option now is uh, deriving through the integration of computational fluid dynamics um, an FFR from a resting coronary CT angiogram without any additional downstream testing, without any change in radiation or change in protocols, and without the administration of adenosine. There are additional costs, at least with the offline testing, in that it does require co computational post-processing, and that's associated, at least in those countries uh, where it's available clinically, with increased costs, but no additional testing. So how can this be done? Well, this can be done by essentially integrating uh, knowledge that, was, that has evolved really over the last 150 years, dating back to Newton's laws of mass conservation and momentum balance and then evolving through fluid dynamics through two very bright people by the name of Navier and Stokes that were able to solve the equations for pressure and flow and velocity across uh, for all non-compressible fluids, for all Newtonian so-called fluids. The problem is this could never be applied to the coronary arteries because we lacked an anatomical model and we lacked the computational processing capacity to actually solve these much more complex equations than, for example, the equations of wind speed and drag on, on, a, on, a, on an aircraft or on a uh, race car. But now, of course, we do have uh, patient-specific epicardial arterial geometry from a good quality coronary CT angiogram. We know that the heart vessel interactions hold true, that the allometric scaling laws relate pressure to flow, that the microcirculatory resistance is inversely related to the coronary size, that patients with more myocardial mass uh, I know you guys have a lot of research in Calgary looking at those biathletes and, and high endurance training, you know, patients with more myocardial mass, of course, have more myocardial flow uh, at rest, and let's say have angina at rest. We know that blood is a Newtonian fluid, so you can adjust a patient's specific viscosity based on hematocrit. We can actually induce hyperemia, theoretically, assume that maximum hyperemia is achieved by essentially data, uh, deri uh, based on data derived from Bob Wilson's lab back in 1998 from the University of Minnesota. And then the equations that govern all fluid, inclusive of blood, can be applied to solve for coronary pressure and velocity anywhere in the coronary tree. So again, we have the finite element modeling, uh, integrating the epicardial mesh and the coronary boundary conditions of the aorta and the coronary arteries. We know that there's an allometric scaling law that governs the amount of fluid, so there's really an abundance of physiological information from anatomical data that's ignored by the human eye. And that I think we're all seeing through machine learning and all of these advanced algorithms that are now detecting many findings on imaging that, that you know, I'm, that we're grossly ignorant to over the years. But this one is an obvious one, right? That if you have a bigger coronary, you have more flow. If you have a bigger fistula, you have more flow. We also know that the coronary flow relates to coronary size, and that's why you cardiologists tell your patients to exercise, of course, because, you know, as there's more flow, as you pump more and you have more flow through the coronary arteries, they adapt and they actually enlarge over time and will remodel to develop a homeostatic level of shear stress. And then <clears throat> we can even go beyond that and look at that form function relationship between myocardial mass and epicardial coronary size as well. And finally, the boundary conditions are very important. The pulsatile flow, flow can be then measured or, or calculated based on time varying, <coughs> pardon me, intramyocardial pressures. And then uh, finally, the induction of hyperemia, which assumes we know that hyperemia plateaus at 140 micrograms per kg per minute. That's why when you, of course, do your stress CMRs, that's the dose you use. And, you know, many will say that assumes that the patient will achieve hyperemia at the time of the cath lab. And you're right. But that's why FFRCT is a conservative um, uh, assumption because if they don't achieve maximal hyperemia at the type of the cath at the time of the cath, the measured FFR will actually be higher than the FFRCT, making sure that you don't deny someone <coughs> with your non-invasive tests of potentially life improving, if not um, more morbidity, if not mortality improving, uh, FFR measurement and revascularization. So some examples, we see a true positive, sorry, FFRCT here on the top, atherosclerosis, moderate anatomical stenosis, 
How severe? I'm not sure. Does it really matter? I think what matters now is we know the patient has atherosclerosis. We know the patient likely will benefit from uh, medical therapy, but should they go to the cath lab? If we look at the measured FFR, I would suggest that that's, that extensive atherosclerosis is associated with significant pressure drop, as noted by the FFR CT as well. Interestingly, we see this lesion, very high grade focal lesion, at least by CTA, <laughs> and not maybe as high grade by invasive angiography, but nonetheless fairly high grade, and yet by measured FFR, fairly compellingly FFR negative. And here we can see the corresponding true negative FFR CT of 0.87. If we look at the diagnostic performance of FFRCT as compared to the invasive gold standard of lesion-specific ischemia of FFR, we could see the most contemporary data, which is the NXT data published uh, by Bjarne Norgard and Jack in 2014. And when we compare again to measured FFR as the gold standard, you can see that FFRCT in red far surpasses not only CT, but also invasive angiography with a drastic improvement in specificity and positive predictive value without a significant sacrifice in sensitivity or negative predictive value. I'm going to go see a respirologist after this. I apologize. Um, and really, I think the strength of the FFRCT, if there is one, is the ability, especially in sites where CT is driving unnecessary invasive assessment, is perhaps, and, and those aren't necessarily sites doing high volume with very expert readers, but perhaps sites that are doing less volume where also the clinical cardiologists are less comfortable treating people medically and they're just referring patients with moderate anatomical disease right to the cath lab, there's perhaps there's greater comfort in actually deferring invasive assessment uh, by integration of FFRCT and reclassification of these 50 to 70 percent mid-LAD lesions as being so-called true negatives by FFRCT and by then uh, as adjudicated by measured FFR. We've also looked at these, uh, the diagnostic performance of FFRCT in a number of populations. We published recently in JCCT that the area under the curve as compared to uh, invasive FFR for the discrimination of lesion-specific ischemia is comparable in men and women. I think this is also another potential clinical utility, which is intermediate stenosis. You know, it's easy to say if we send this patient, for example, with exuberant atherosclerosis and a moderate anatomical stenosis by CT, and we see all this plaque and we send that patient to the cath lab, they go to the cath lab, she's a woman, she's English is her second language, she's kind of heavy set, she's not very active, she doesn't look like that picture from the Netter textbook and she doesn't give you, she doesn't answer your questions like she has classic angina, and then you cath her and you see that lesion. and. She, I'm confident the overwhelming majority of such patients are just sent home from that cath lab, uh, being told that they have uh, microvascular disease or mild anatomical coronary disease. But you can see that we wouldn't necessarily have been wrong by CT because that patient has probably very extensive plaque and that may in fact be driving down that measured fractional flow reserve to a true positive 0.71. So look, and, and so the cath people are very quick to tell us, you know, you're sending us too many of these patients with a 50 to 70% stenosis, but they're also very quick to ignore their own data and realize that many of these patients, perhaps uh, where we're overcalling anatomical stenosis CT because of exuberant plaque, maybe many of those patients are actually FFR positive. So can we use CT to help us with this difficult clinical question? Prox LAD lesion, intermediate stenosis, low density plaque, outward expansion, you know, not plaque we would want in our coronary arteries, but not a high-grade lesion. Should this patient be cath? You know if you just send them to the cath lab, they're likely to yell at you saying you overcalled stenosis Leipzig. So how about FFRCT? Well, you can see that FFRCT can be quite helpful. If you cath this guy, you may not be that convinced that this is a high-grade lesion, but perhaps if we send the patient to the cath lab with an intermediate stenosis and a strongly positive FFRCT, that will Behoove, it will behoove the invasive int or the interventionist to actually measure the fractional flow reserve and determine whether or not that lesion is driving a pressure gradient across the stenosis. Here we can see data. <coughs> this is, sorry, from the Discover Flow trial. This is now a few years old that Jim and myself published. And you could see that there was a 35% improvement in accuracy in these intermediate stenosis with a significant improvement in specificity as compared to CT alone. 
Finally, what's the reproducibility of FFRCT like? It's actually better than FFR. Granted, it's computationally modeled, but if you redo the model entirely and rerun the analysis, you'll actually have more reproducibility than the invasive gold standard. <clears throat> and to close, what are the other potential benefits of FFRCT? That would be in this setting of calcification. This is actually no longer in press, but it's actually in print in January in Jack Imaging by our a colleague, uh, Bjarne Norgaard, again from uh, Aarhus, Denmark, and you can see that FFRCT is not immune to high calcium, but it's significantly better than CT alone. So he, here we could see low to mid uh, Agatston score, high Agatston score, low to mid, and high Agatston score. Now for CTA in the dad, dosh, dash line, and for FFRCT in the, in the uh, continuous lines, and you could see that when you look at the continuous line for high Agatston score, the diagnostic performance, the area under the curve is 0.86, which is actually better than CT alone, even with a low Agatston score. And similarly, if you look at stratified now, uh, this is in patients uh, <clears throat> with uh, even higher level and, and known disease, you get similar uh, diagnostic performance. So how about some clinical cases? We have a patient with suspected disease. We have calcium. Can we use it? Uh, we have a calcium score of greater than 400, and you can see that the specificity starts going down for FFRCT, but nowhere near, uh, nowhere near the way it does uh, for CT alone. Here with FFRCT, the specificity of 69% with a calcium score of greater than 400, the accuracy reduced, but still a significant incremental bump over CT alone. So let's look at some clinical cases again. So here's a patient, 65-year-old, with hypertension and dyslipidemia. You can see that the uh, Diamond Forrester classification, which needs, I think we would all agree, contemporary reappraisal, that would suggest that there's a 60% likelihood of obstructive coronary disease. A treadmill is done. The problem, of course, with the treadmill is that if you do a treadmill, you're left with even a negative study, a, a post-test likelihood that's probably too high to ignore. So they elected here, in this case in Monzino and Milan, to perform a coronary CT angiogram. The coronary CT angiogram was performed, and we can see here atherosclerosis in the proximal LAD with an intermediate stenosis. They deemed it to be 60%. I would put it you know, right in the 50 to 70% level. What should you do? Should you send this patient to the cath lab? I probably wouldn't. At our site, we would probably just treat this patient medically. But, you know, can I be certain that this patient doesn't have uh, lesion-specific ischemia? Can I be certain that this patient wouldn't at least derive a, a, a significant uh, a quality of life benefit from, or an angina relief benefit from a, an FFR-positive revascularization? They elected in Milan to send the patient for an FFRCT, and you can see the FFRCT is negative at 0.83. The patient was followed to a year, no clinical indication for ICA, no, uh, no uh, event at one year's time. How about in the setting of calcium? Here we see a calcified lesion. Again, sorry I'm running through this, but this is just the clinical history. High pretest likelihood of obstructive coronary disease, an older male patient. A negative study if a treadmill is still not going to reduce your post-test likelihood low enough to probably not undergo other uh, evaluation. Here's the uh, coronary CT angiogram. I think we would probably just dismiss this patient, but there's significant calcium. As we all know, that's an Achilles heel of cardiac CT. How severe is the stenosis? Probably modest, but in this case, greater confidence by a negative FFRCT of 0.88, thereby allowing them in Milan to safely defer this case, and again, no, no uh, clinical event at one year's time. So <clears throat> are there issues with FFRCT? Obviously, it's not a dumping ground for poor quality CTs. You need to actually perform best best quality, uh, uh, best practice CT, you need to rate control your patients, you need to administer nitroglycerin. If you don't give nitroglycerin, there's an assumption of vasodilation. If it's not given, that's a problem that results in, in unfortunately, false positive FFRCTs. So it's not without limitations, without question, uh, and we certainly have to do our part to make sure that the, the image data that's sent off for analysis is best as possible. So for the final five minutes, I thought I would close on the clinical utility of FFRCT. I'm sure some of you are aware of this trial. It was presented as a late-breaking clinical trial at ESC and published online in EHJ by Pam Douglas, Manesh Patel, and Gianluca Pantone and others. And it was a pragmatic, non-randomized clinical trial. And this was for patients. There were really two arms. There's the non-invasive arm, 
which is cohort one, these are patients that were referred for clinically indicated usual diagnostic care. So they were referred for non-invasive testing. Traditionally, non-invasive ischemia testing in Europe, you know, ECHO or, or uh, SPECT or PET or, WW or stress CMR or treadmill testing. And then, uh, then the uh, second arm would be those that were traditionally referred for invasive testing. So they're already going to the cath lab. So there's two separate arms that are being evaluated. And in the roll-in phase, if you're in uh, St. Paul's Hospital, you just do have whatever testing you wanted non-invasively. And if you were in the roll-in phase and you were in the arm B and you were referred to the cath lab, you would just have your cath. Then there was a hard stop and then cohort 2 started, so it was non-overlapping cohorts. If you were now 2A where you were referred for traditional non-invasive testing, you would then undergo CTA first instead of your non-invasive testing. If you were referred for usual care invasive assessment, so you're already going to the cath lab, they would say, hey, hold a minute before you go to the cath lab at the CTA, and if there was no stenosis in a vessel greater than 2 millimeters by 30%, no FFRCT. If there was, you'd undergo FFRCT. And, and if you were in the non-invasive arm, you would just be followed. If you were in the invasive arm, you would only undergo invasive assessment uh, if you had an FFR positive lesion by C FFRCT, and you would just be followed otherwise if you did not. The, the primary endpoint was the rate of ICA without obstructive disease between 1B and 2B, in the in, at 90 days, so in the dedicated invasive arm, and then the secondary endpoint were quality of life, MACE, and resource utilization. So if we look at the sorry, if we look at the uh, endpoint, the primary endpoint of the invasive arm in the role in phase usual care, the prevalence of obstruct or the incidence of obstructive disease at the time of cath was 27% in these in this multicenter study. Following the integration of CT and FFRCT, there was an 83% reduction in, in non-obstructive disease at the time of the cath from 73 to 12%. But I'll highlight the prevalence of, or the incidence of obstructive disease was very comparable between the CTA arm and the direct cath arm, suggesting at least without certainty, we don't know definitely that there weren't patients missed, but that the rate of obstructive disease was comparable, suggesting that CT and then FFRCT were successful in weeding out those without obstructive disease without missing a significant number of patients with obstructive disease because the, prev the incidence of obstructive disease was quite comparable. Importantly, there were no adverse events in patients in whom ICA was canceled out to one year. When we look at the cost effectiveness data, this was published by Mark Latke and presented as a late breaker at TCT. You can see that without Medicare reimbursement, assuming an FFRCT value of zero, there would be a significant reduction in cost. Assuming an FFRCT value of $2,100, which is obviously much greater than I think any of us could afford to ever pay, there would still be a potential cost savings in an American model, given all the limitations of that, but nonetheless, a cost-effective analysis performed by uh, uh, Mark Latke at Stanford. So I think I'm now 44 minutes in. I should stop. but. Uh, you know, I came across like a zealot. I probably end one. I'm sorry. I don't think CT is a perfect test by any means. Uh, and, I, and I think there are other non-invasive tests that play a tremendous role uh, for coronary artery disease evaluation. But I think that at this time in 2016, I think that all of us in Canada need to be probably pushing for greater accessibility to both CT and MR. Uh, as tests uh, for first the diagnosis of coronary disease and then the downstream utilization of either FFRCT or stress perfusion MRI for the adjudication of the hemodynamic significance of said stenosis prior to invasive evaluation. So thank you again for the opportunity and uh, I look forward to any questions. Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and I think um, really highlights some of the more contemporary applications of post-processing and CTA. So uh, really appreciate your focus on that. Um, I'm gonna open up questions to those on the line first. Um, if you can just simply unmute and uh, you'll be able to talk and hopefully Jonathan can hear you and respond. 